Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to our series Science and the Quran. Today's topic is water, appreciating its essentiality. Before talking about why are we discussing this, let's look at a verse from the Quran. This verse from Surah Al Waqi'ah, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar Rajeem, Afara'aytumul Ma' Al Ladi Tashrabu. Have you ever considered the water which you drink? So here the Qur'an is asking us very pointedly, have we ever considered water? Have we ever thought about it? Of course, water is ubiquitous. It covers so much of the planet. It comes down in rain like what's coming outside. Now today as I'm taping, we shower, we water our grass, and we really take water for granted. And we are now being asked, have we ever thought about water? So let's put this in context. We have already outlined the three threads that inshallah we will follow in this course. We gave an example of the first thread which is looking at general philosophical issues like the laws of nature when we talked about Newton's law of gravitation for example. Why do such laws exist? Why do they have the form that they have? Why can we understand them? And inshallah we will come back to that topic over and over. The second thread is to look at specific verses that make a very, very particular point and in an almost miraculous way show that there is no, or really not almost miraculous, in a truly miraculous way, show that there is no way that those verses could have been authored by the Prophet, peace be upon him. So an example of that was verse 125 from Surah Al-An'am about the feeling of chest tightness when we ascend rapidly into the sky. Now, let us use water to illustrate the third thread, and that is to look at the science behind a certain topic to truly gain a deeper appreciation of those verses in the Quran that discuss that topic. Not so much with an eye to proving the authenticity of the Quran, if you will, but coming at it from the perspective of believers who want to better appreciate the Quran. And that, I think, is really the most important of the three threads, but inshallah we will try to follow them all and enjoy them all together. So, what does the Qur'an say about water? Let's look at this verse from Surah Al-Anbiya, which we will inshallah also come back to in another context. أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَ رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيِّ أَفَلَ يُؤْمِنُونَ I'd like to just focus on the last part of this verse. That have the unbelievers not seen or are they not aware or have they not considered that we have made out of water every living thing, will they then not believe? A very similar statement is made in Surah An-Nur. وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَ كُلَّ دَابَّةٍ مِّن مَّاءٍ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى بَطْنِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى رِجْلَيْنِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى أَرْبَعٍ يَخْلُقُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ That Allah has created all animals out of water. And the rest of the verse where the translation is down below. Then in this verse from Surah Al-Furqan, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ مِنَ الْمَاءِ بَشَرًا فَجَعَلَهُ نَسَبًا وَصِهْرًا وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ قَضِيرًا And he is the one who created from water man. He created man from water and endowed him with the consciousness of descent and the marriage tie. For thy sustainer is ever infinite in his power. And so God's creative power is linked here in this verse to his creating the human being out of water. So what the Quran is telling us is that water is the basis of life. Now obviously, for the ancient Arabians uh, who lived in the desert at the time of the Prophet وسلم, they of course understood the essentiality of water. It was very hot in the desert. If you don't drink, you die. And here in this oasis, for example, where there are plants around the oasis, but not in the barren desert, that without rain, no plants grow. However, it has really been only very recently that a deeper appreciation of how special water is has begun to develop. I would say from the late 1700s, continuing into the present. 
First of all, life, when defined as follows, that it's a complex chemical system capable of assembling and replicating itself, of manipulating its components and drawing its vital nutrients and constituents from its environment, has to exist in a liquid phase. Water cannot exist in a solid phase because molecules can't be easily moved around and assembled and broken down and nutrients absorbed and waste products gotten rid of. That requires a liquid phase. And Star Trek notwithstanding, life could also not exist in a gas phase because there molecules are too far apart, too dispersed, they are not contained in any physical space, and so water has to occur in a life, forgive me, has to occur in a liquid phase, and that liquid phase turns out to be water. The most recent estimates suggest that the average human has about 37.2 trillion cells. Each cell has a membrane, and that membrane encloses a water-based cytoplasm and some intracellular organelles. And outside those cells is also a water matrix that bathes the cells. Therefore, now knowing that we are made of cells, which by the way is an extremely recent discovery in human history after the discovery of the microscope, entirely unknown to 7th century Arabs, and that those cells are essentially membranes that are enclosing a water-based cytoplasm, it becomes very clear that indeed we have been created out of water, that water is the matrix of life. And we could certainly stop right here, say, SubhanAllah, look at this statement that the Qur'an made that everything has been created out of water, and be very happy with our understanding. But once again, our mandate is to try to go deeper. Right now, modern science concurs on the following. Look at this quote from George Whitesides from the Department of Chemistry at Harvard. Life occurs in water. All life, so far as we know, involves molecules and salts dissolved or organized in a medium that is mostly water. We do not know whether water is essential to all life or just life as we know it, but at this time we know no exceptions. Life occurs in water. And in fact, one of NASA's guiding principles in the search for alien life is, quote, follow the water. Philip Ball, author of the book Life's Matrix, A Biography of Water, says that liquid water is essential for the kind of delicate chemistry that makes life possible. And now scientists are really beginning to understand something about why this is so. There's an amazing symbiosis between the properties that make life possible on our planet by stabilizing the biosphere and that make water the matrix for life at the level of individual cells and organisms. And so scientists, for example, in this recent paper from 2004 from the Royal Society, from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University College in London, are saying, water, what's so special about it? And they are answering that question in very, very deep terms. And the answer is really, are at three levels. The physical properties of water, what is it that makes it so special? The atomic structure of water that gives rise to those physical properties, and the quantum mechanics underlying that atomic structure. We will try to focus on point one and a little bit of point two, and really leave point three alone at least for now. So let's begin by looking at a brief history of the science of water. It was between 1780 and 1800 that scientists like Henry Cavendish, Antoine Lavoisier, and John Ritter discovered and confirmed that water is made of H2O. It is a compound, two hydrogens and one oxygen, and not an element as, for example, Aristotle thought. In fact, hydrogen is Greek for water former. Then in the early 1900s, the orbital theory of atoms was developed. Those of you who have studied some chemistry in high school will recognize models like this, where there are electron orbitals that the electrons fit in, and it was discovered that water has a so-called tetrahedral structure, where it is shaped like a pyramid with oxygen at the center, electrons from oxygen at two corners, and hydrogen atoms at the other two corners, and so water has this sort of bent structure like this. This bent structure turns out to be extremely special. 
because oxygen, which is electronegative, meaning that it likes electrons, pulls more of the electrons toward itself in the shared bond with hydrogen, and so it ends up being a little bit negatively charged. Hydrogen, being less electronegative, ends up being a little bit positively charged. And so water is what is known as a polar molecule. It has one charge at one end and different charge on the other end. And it was in the late 1920s that the concept of hydrogen bonding, which is nearly unique to water and essential to its physical properties, was discovered. One of the big names in this was Linus Pauling, one of the very few people to win two Nobel Prizes. And in 1929, he developed the theory of hydrogen bonding by solving the Schrodinger equation for water. And the following was discovered. That yes, water molecules are one oxygen and two hydrogens bound together strongly by covalent bonds, but water molecules also attract each other by so-called hydrogen bonds. These are electrical attractions here, the negative end of water, oxygen, remember oxygen is slightly negatively charged, attracts the positive end, the hydrogen, of another water molecule, and so the water molecules are bound together. But they're bound together very loosely. Water, in fact, is called a statistical liquid by scientists, with these hydrogen bonds linking different water molecules, forming and breaking every hundred billionth of a second. And even today, very active computer simulation research continues to try to elucidate the structure of water and what this hydrogen bonding really means. For now, however, suffice it to say that science has coalesced on the notion very nicely expressed by Harold Morowitz, professor of molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale, that, quote, the more that is learned the firmer is the conviction that water is a truly unique substance. And in fact, a recent book called Water and Life, The Unique Properties of H2O, is entirely devoted to studying the physical properties of water at an extremely deep level, including the level of quantum mechanics. And so, inshallah, we will then begin our journey through some of these amazing properties of water with the goal of deepening our appreciation and inshallah developing the capacity that when the Quran asks us have you ever considered water we would say yes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we did our best to learn something about why it is truly miraculous and why it is the matrix of life so we'll see you next time inshallah to begin that journey Salaamu Alaikum